I know that you're awake, and that's good, because somebody has to be awake, and it's not me. It was just a, just an arduous week that we had to go through. Everybody did just well, I'm quite sure. No overeating. I'm not preaching to gluttons or anything like that. We're delighted that you're here, and we want you to stay afterwards for a time of fellowship. Hope that you can do that. It really increases the fellowship factor considerably. Notice that the church calendar is really full. Notice that Jim Hendricks will be here. We've had Jim, I think, for about the last three years, and he's always been a blessing. So mark it on your calendar and be sure to invite a friend, or if you don't have any friends, invite an enemy. They're good to sit next to as well. So notice that the ministries will be uh, coming online again, at least uh, by the, about the 7th of January, which is coming in about three minutes, the way the calendar is working these days. And then notice also, come and help us ring in 2020. You can tell that we are in a seniors community. Notice that we're going to ring in the New Year's at 9 o'clock. Uh, New York time, when the ball goes down in New York, we will be saying hip, hip, hooray. And then we'll have a closing word of prayer and get home, and we won't be too late for bedtime. So notice what's there, and come and be with us and have that be a part of the welcoming the New Year in. May the Lord richly bless us as we are here today to worship him and to adore him. God bless. Well, Happy New Year, you guys. I hope you had a Merry Christmas. We're going to sing Good Christian Men Rejoice, and that's for you too, women. Men and women, please stand and sing Good Christian Men Rejoice on 273, verse 1 and 3. 273 Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice give heed to what we say news, news Jesus Christ is born today all sinners before him and he seated. If you have your Bibles handy, I'd like to ask you to join me in reading a little bit of Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. We come to worship this morning and in word and song. So if you'll bow your heads, I'd like to pray with you. Father, we do come to worship you. And we know that you're in your house and you're here with us. We worship you in word and song. We worship you through your scripture. We want to lift up Pastor Don to you this morning as he brings the message, as he brings your word to us. 
we lift up Alice as she leads us in, in song. And we praise you, Lord, for the songs that we sing. Praise you, Lord, for all the good things that we have here at Trinity Bible. Lord, I praise you for the birth of your son that we've just celebrated. Lord, I pray that your spirit will fill every heart in this room this morning. Give us the direction and guidance that we all need as we approach a new year. But we pray right now, Lord, for your very presence and in your son's very special name we pray. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 294. And we're going to sing this gospel song today that really gives the whole story. But we're going to sing 1, 2, and 4. Verse 1, 2, and 4. <laughs> together in prayer. Our Father, again, as we approach your throne of grace, we indeed are reminded that wherever two or three are gathered in 
the name of your son he is there with us has already been pointed out and we rejoice in this and we thank you for all of that it indicates and promises as we look forward to that time when the king of kings and the lord of lords will come with the shout and the trumpet of the archangel and we look forward to those times until then we give some thought to your care as you pour out your grace upon us day by day you give to us the things of material need and you give to us the things of spiritual need you are indeed our father and sustainer in every way we thank you for these gifts that you have provided for us that we can give back to you and we ask that you would be pleased with these gifts as expressions of our love and thanks to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Join our hearts together as we sing, We Will Glorify. side and she's in the wheelchair 
Well, he's in the hospital, and it's just a matter of time until the Lord takes him home. So we want to remember uh, Bob's family and keep in mind all of the other prayer requests that are on here as well. Let's join together in the reading of Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 5b and 6. Together. O may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word this day. Let's join together in prayer. Our Father, as we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we approach your throne of grace, and we thank you that because of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to us your throne is one of grace. And may we always be filled with thanksgiving when we know how we are abundantly supplied by your grace that meets our every need. We do take this time to repeat the things that have been said in your word this day that we have read, that you alone are the one who has made the heavens and the heaven of heavens with all their host, and you are the creator of the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And we thank you, our Father, that you give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. We thank you for the life that you've given to us in Christ Jesus. May we always be filled with thanksgiving. We ask that as we gather here this day that you would remember those who cannot be with us, be with those who are still with family and with friends elsewhere, keep them healthy, keep them safe, and bring them back to us soon. We ask that you would be with those who can't be with us this day due to illness and poor health. Encourage them, comfort them, strengthen them. And we want to remember the Kinney family at this time, particularly we ask that the promise of the resurrection and the return will give strength to that family. We thank you for Bob and for all that he has done in his life and all that he has done in his life here at Trinity. And we ask our Father that we will remember him always with joy and thanksgiving. We ask as a congregation that you would be with those who are in leadership over us. As we think of our president and the cabinet, we think of the Senate, and we think of the House. And we ask our Father that you would give them some sense of responsibility for the country. As we have indeed elected these people, we ask that you would give them the strength to represent as it should be done. We just pray, our Father, that you would use the churches of the land to call for a sense of righteousness that has been diminishing over the decades. And we pray that there would be not only a revival, but actually a reformation that would do a great work in this country. And we do pray for our leaders as your word has called us to do. And we would ask that you would be with those who have gone to the far off places, they've left their home, they've left their country, as they have followed the call to go to different places to present the gospel. In some places it's quite difficult and their lives are on the line. And so we pray, our Father, that you'd give them a sense of strength and a sense of courage and that they know that you are working in and through them. We ask now that for the remainder of this service that you would indeed encourage us, your people, in every way. We thank you for the time that we can have together. May it be one of mutual encouragement. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. We're going to turn to page 372 and stand as we sing Our God Reigns, a song that tells us all about the reasons why our Lord came and died for our sins and the magnificent fact that he reigns today. Please stand as we sing Our God Reigns, 372. <laughs>
all God's people said, please be seated. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, congregation. The singing this morning was a particular blessing. And if I had any sense, I'd have a closing word of prayer while we're on the high side of it all. And, and Mickey, too, thank you. We invite your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And as you turn there, I did receive some information that our friend and colleague, Bob Kinney, stepped into the presence of the Lord at about 8.30 this morning. First Timothy chapter 1 verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the God of our instruction, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters which they make confident assertions. As we take a look at how fast the year has gone by, by the time we get our new calendars, we're already writing them in, and we're already writing things in clear up to June or July. And we hardly get the book closed and it is June or July. And what I wanted us to do is to go over some things that we know. And so we begin with James chapter 4. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, and engage in business, and make a profit, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while, and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. And that's just about right, isn't it? And I know that most of us here, at one time or another, if we don't say those words, if the Lord wills, we certainly have it on our mind. And as we give some thought to the coming year, we will sit and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And the fact of the matter is, the only thing we know about the future is what we would like to do, not what we will be able to do. And so it is important that we say, if the Lord wills. But there's one thing for certain. I also know that there are some things that we take into the new year and we can talk about those things because this is a part of our life that we take with us. And so as we take a look and we go over some of the things that we know, I don't think that there will be anything new here. What I do think is it's a reminder of who we are and why we're here. And we speak of responsibility. We speak of responsibility to discharge during the days of our lives. And we have three mandates that we should follow. And notice the first one is to preserve the gospel. And the second is to be permeated by the gospel. And the third is to present the gospel. And like I say, I don't think that there's anything new here, something that you haven't heard at least once before. But I'll borrow Peter's words and say, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, and mind as well. And let's give some thought to what is said here, because this sets the stage for how we live our lives as Christians. 
Notice what Paul says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Guard the treasure that has been entrusted to you. Have we stopped to think about what the gospel is to your life and mine? The gospel is the good news of God's love sent to us through Jesus Christ and what that love accomplished in those three years of ministry. And we're to preserve that message because it is a treasure. Stop and think. What would your life be like without Christ? I have some idea of what mine might be like without Christ, and it isn't a very pretty picture. And so we know that the gospel is a treasure. It's a treasure of life for you, for me, and for others who follow in the footsteps of our Lord. Notice that we have a treasure, and we have the responsibility to guard it, to keep it whole to keep it complete, to keep it unsullied. We are fiduciaries of the gospel. I like that. I am, I'm Donald Fiduciary Furl, and you can call it yourself, whatever you can do with that. But it's fun to do, but it's a pleasure that we are called to guard it. Most of our lives go on day by day, and sometimes we say, it's a routine. Well, yes, it's a routine. But in that routine, there is the privilege, the high privilege, of guarding the treasure of life everlasting and life abundant. And that treasure is nothing other than the words of Christ. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, notice that this treasure is nothing other than the words of Christ. Friends, as per usual for at least the last two decades that I know of and even more, the Bible is still one of the best sellers in the United States. It's always in the top ten, and oftentimes over the years it's been number one. But by the same token, that book gathers more dust than any other book in one's library. It is the least read of all books possessed by people. And I would like to ask the question, how do we take care of a treasure if we don't know what that treasure is? And eventually, it looks like that treasure incorporates your life and mine. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, healthy words, words that accurately represent God's love and God's grace and God's mercy, and notice most importantly, those of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible studies are starting up again. And as we open up the book, may we keep in mind that we are looking at a treasure. And not only that, we are looking at the words of Jesus Christ. According to this passage and at least one other that I know of, every, every page in the Bible should be a red letter edition because these are the words of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And the treasure is life changing and the change is conformity to God's will for our lives. Now we'll stop for some kind of a plug and a presentation for the pastor's Bible study. We're going to be studying anthropology, the doctrine of the study of man. And it's interesting to see who the Bible says we are and what our task is. And our privilege is to be the image of the everlasting God. And therefore, when it speaks of conformity of God's will for our lives, it's speaking of our purpose in life. I'll throw it in anyway. I really love to watch those programs up on the zoo. I like the zoo in England. I like the zoo in San Diego. And I think there's another zoo somewhere. And I always like the zoo. But it's fun to watch them and to basically say, what is their life? Their life basically is to eat, to sleep, to propagate. And you know, that doesn't say much about their lives. But ours is pretty well the same if we don't have a purpose. When we are followers of Jesus Christ, we have a purpose. And the question would fairly well be, is that purpose significant enough? Do we do more than just eat, drink, and be merry? Or is there something else to life as well that gives us an added joy that nothing else can give to us? And that is to represent the God who created us and the one who redeemed us. And that treasure, therefore, takes us back 
to the words of Christ. When the psalm was read this morning, that was reading of the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And notice we are also to ensure that our teachings conform to the sound words of the gospel. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which you are in Christ. The teachings. Understand them. Understand what is being said and why and how it should be applied to our lives today. That does not provide a foundation so that we can create our own theology, our own philosophy, but it's rather to be understood so that we can know what is going on and what we should be doing. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Let us at least commit ourselves to renew our understanding, to broaden our understanding of the word of God because this is the treasure that God has given to us. This is a part of that treasure that we have in and through Jesus Christ. And notice that false doctrines must be confronted. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. On a lighter note, I thought, I wonder if I'm supposed, I'm forbidden to pay money to find out what my DNA will tell me as to where my ancestors are. I don't think he's got that in mind, but I thought I'd pass that along to you anyway to see that we do proper application of God's word. But notice because there is a tension away from the truth when we start paying attention to strange meaning heterodox doctrines and teachings. And let's be sure that we know the word of God <coughs> comprehensively so that we will know when there is speculation afoot and when we know that the progress of God's redemptive plan is indeed being challenged. Notice that Paul's admonition is to the elders of Ephesus and it is still applicable. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on God for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now what, I'm, what I have in the back of my mind, friends, is simply this. That a lot of times in church life you hear people say, oh, deep teachings and theology and doctrines they belong to the Bible colleges and the seminaries. They don't belong in church. Now my question is, do you know when the first Bible college was instituted? Do you know when the first seminary was instituted? I should have the answer if I'm going to ask the question, but generally I know this. The church was around for quite a few centuries before they ever came up with a seminary. A local church has to be its own Bible college. It has to be its own seminary. And it has to be, have men and women who love the word deeply that will dive into it, dig into it, bring out the nuggets of the treasure and share it with the brothers and the sisters. But notice the job of the elders. Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. So the elders are to be on guard for themselves and for all of the flock. And notice he says, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. This is why Paul tells us in 1 Timothy that we are to have godly men who will serve as elders, men who know what God's word has to say and encourages the flock to follow in the path of what the word calls us to do and to be. And notice it is for the, for the entire purpose of God. Notice this. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. It is not enough just to speak of the purpose of God that we like. It's only enough when the purpose of God in its entirety is given to the congregation. We are to basically take care of, protect, and to guard the word of God. And we do it in part by being permeated by the gospel itself. Notice that we are people concerned with the inner man. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience 
and a sincere faith. Notice that the concern here at this point is what goes on in our hearts, what goes on in our souls, what goes on in our minds. There is an interest in the inner man. And if the inner man is not cared for properly, the outer man will finally display it and show it for what it is. That we are to be people whose lives are directed by love. Often is the time we hear people talk about love and it's a, an emotional expression. Love in the Bible may have some emotional aspects to it, but it is primarily an ethical principle by which we live our lives. We are to love God with the totality of our being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus gives us that privilege once again to do what we are called upon to do. But notice the statement, but the goal of our instruction is love. When we stand in the pulpit and we preach some part of the Bible that says, what's this got to do with anything else? Somewhere it has to do with bringing us into a closer relationship with God, to have a love that is much more compatible with the goal and with the instruction than what it presently is. But the goal of our instruction is love. But not just love, notice, love that comes from a morally pure heart. That morally pure heart has been guided and guarded by a good conscience, and notice the foundation. Love that comes from a sincere faith. Notice that when we truly believe in God through Jesus Christ, there is the inclination, the drive, to have a love that reflects the love of Jesus Christ. And so we are people who are concerned with the inner man. What is my faith? How strong is my faith? How sincere is my faith? And we were talking to someone the other day and years ago when I was a youth pastor, and that was years ago, there was a man in the church and his family had been there. The family, I think, goes back to like the grandparents. This was one of the older churches in LA and he had been living in Glendale for some time doing business there and everybody in the congregation was upset because brother and sister so-and-so were pulling out of the church and joining another one. Well, for one thing, they were pulling out of a Presbyterian church and going to a Methodist church, and I thought, well, I don't know how anybody's doctrine is going to be able to cover that span, but so it is. And I had the opportunity between the breaks, between church services, and got to talking to him, and he says, well, I decided to join the Methodist church because I do business with more of those people than I do with you guys. And I thought to myself, well, now there is a good reason for making the shift, and that told me everything that I needed to know. We need a sincere faith, a faith that will reflect Jesus Christ in our lives, a faith that will express Jesus Christ in our activities. When that faith is sincere, this is where it all begins. When that faith is sincere, it will produce and sustain a pure heart and an active conscience that will keep that heart pure. And then when that love is expressed, it is expressed from a sincere faith. And that's what we are after. That all of the teachings that we try to have here and other churches is not just so that we can say, we know this theology book, or we know this theology. It's because we want to have lives changed, our own as well as others. And so we're people concerned with the inner man and we are people concerned with our fellow man, too. Notice, love does no wrong. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Notice that in basically in ethics, we are concerned with two things, what we do and what we don't do. And we have to be right. Notice that sometimes we may not be able to do anything good for a person but we can do some harm. And notice that this basically says that our love will do no harm. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. And therefore, just on these grounds alone, it is the fulfillment of the law because the law basically says, do not do wrong to your neighbor. Do not kill your neighbor. He's got the right to life. Do not steal from your labor. neighbor. He's got the right to property. Do not basically destroy the reputation of your neighbor because he has the right to a proper repu reputation. And so it goes. And our love will do no harm, but notice when it is positively expressed, 
our love will edify. It will build up. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Notice what we are called to do as Christians. We do no harm because of love, and we do that which is good and positive. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, so that by the time we are through, that neighbor has been blessed because of our relationship and because of our activity. And notice that the purpose is edification, to build that person up, that that person's life is better because we have interacted with him or with her. Love does no harm, and love will only build up and edify one neighbor. And our love stands ready to edify and give grace. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. What a statement. Our love stands ready to edify. How can I help you? What can I do to build your faith and to make it stronger? What can I do to bring a blessing to you that would draw you closer to the Lord? Notice, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. The term unwholesome means rotten. Let no rotten word proceed from your mouth. But only such words that will be good for building up the neighbor. And notice some that just only good for the moment. It may not have lasting impressions in one way, but there will be a lasting memory of what God has done through you and through me to others. So our love stands ready to edify and to give grace. Thirdly, we have a concern to see our love grow for one another. Notice, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Notice that it is not enough to have love, it is enough to have love that is growing. And notice we don't have much choice on this. It says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, as is only fitting. Why? Because your faith is greatly enlarged. And as well, the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. And that is a reason to give thanks. And when we see brothers and sisters grow in the strength and the understanding of their faith and in the application and the growth of their love, this is reasons to rejoice and to continue to rejoice. And notice not only for one another as brothers and sisters in the faith, but others as well. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. One time I asked the question years ago, just to see what the response would be, and it almost interrupted the flow of the sermon. I asked, I says, what would be your response if all of a sudden you found out that when Hitler was down in the bunker, the last thing he did was accept Jesus Christ, and now he's in heaven waiting for you. I, I see that there's a few objections being registered. Well, I was only using that to get your attention. Don't expect me to give you an answer because I might be shaking my head as well. But notice, and may the Lord cause you to increase and to abound in love, not only for one another, but for all the people, not those who are just easy to love, but those who are hard and difficult to love. And this is our responsibility as it has been in the years gone by and as it will be as we enter into 2020. And we have an obligation to pass the concern on to others. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Notice there is to be the transference of information, the transference of obligation. As one generation leaves the scene and the activities of this life and this age, part of their responsibility is to see to it that the generations coming up behind are aware of the same obligation and that they are doing what they can to pass the information on 
and to live by it as well. So, you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And notice the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Notice, just as it has been entrusted to you, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others as well. Not just to teach, but to teach to faithful men who have the ability to pass on the treasure. And notice that we have an obligation to equip the man of God for every good work. All scripture is inspired by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, and for what purpose, to what end, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Some of this is pretty interesting, don't you think? All scripture is inspired by God. The whole thing is the breath of God. And notice it is profitable. It's profitable for teaching. Now that's safe enough the passing of information, but notice it gets a bit iffy. It's good, for, profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof. Now, who raises their hand to say, Pastor, when it's time to reprove somebody, give me a call. I need to have your name in, on my Rolodex. Notice, but not only for reproof, but for correction. For training, not just for academics, but training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate. And adequate here is too low on, on the list. Actually, it should be qualified and equipped for every good work. Equipped for knowing the word of God. Equipped for living the word of God. Equipped for every good work. This is why we get together. This is one of the basic reasons for our gathering together. And notice that we are obligated to God. Be diligent to present yourself, approved to God as a workman, who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Notice that we are obligated to God to be prepared to handle the word of God. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, but rather be filled with a proper pride and thanksgiving. And for what reason? because there is an understanding of God's word to the extent that it can be properly applied and handled. And notice that the worldly chatter should once again be removed from the agenda. And we are lastly, we are not only to be really inundated by the word and protect the word, but we are to present the gospel, the word of God. And so we go to a verse that's hardly ever used anytime, anywhere. It's a rare one, and I'm sure that this is the first time many of you have ever read it, right? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice that this is a mandate. The, there are primary and secondary commands here. And there's only one primary command, and that is make disciples. Having gone wherever it is that you went, make disciples. And having gone all over the place, make disciples of every nation. And bring them into the fold and let them make their confession by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who has been the provider for their salvation. And notice at the same time, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Here is a mandate that is supposed to be in place for us to the end of the age, and Christ will be there with each generation. Make disciples is primary. Make disciples of all the nations is primary. Notice that Christ promises his presence, but notice that the teaching is a part of making a disciple. And this is the thing as I see it and understand it. You can't make a disciple unless you are a disciple in the best sense of the word. And so we need to understand this and take it quite seriously as we look to the coming year. Not only is the gospel a mandate to us, that mandate is our mission. Notice, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ, will be put to shame. 
Our mandate is our mission. That's the way that it always is, or regularly is. And notice that our mission has requirements, which is really just how it regularly goes. Above all else, there is a dedication to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Sanctify Christ as the Lord. Not just be dedicated to Christ, but be dedicated to him by recognizing his Lordship over our hearts and our lives. And then next, to have a readiness to be ready to respond, to give an account and to make a defense to everyone who asks you. Give an account for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And it's in us. And do it with gentleness and with a reverence and with a respect for your adversary in this particular situation. So that the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile, revile your good behavior in Christ, will be put to shame. There should be indeed a readiness to response. There should be a proper response. There should be a proper attitude, a good conscience, and a good behavior in Christ. And last of all, a proper sense of pride. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Let's keep all of this in mind when it is presenting the gospel. It's really true. If heaven is such a good place, why do we have to wait around to be there? The reason we have to wait around before we can be there is because the Lord put us on notice that we're supposed to tell our generation and the people around us about the future that they have or can have. And the future is either going to be bright or bleak. It's going to be one or the other. And we want them to know that God has loved them enough to send Jesus Christ to care for the sin. And we're not ashamed of that good news because in itself it is the power of God. What then is our challenge for the new year? For not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and of the living. For this new year we should be resolved on just two points, and everything else falls in place. First of all, we need to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ over everything, and most particularly over our lives. We live in the United States, and we hear people all the time talk about their freedom of choice. Friends, freedom is nothing but slavery if it does not acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our hearts and in our lives. Because the true good will is the one that wants to do the will of God. Jesus Christ came and he said, My meat, the thing that gives me life, is to do the will of my Father. And it's no different for you and it's no different for me. So we ought to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our own lives. And then let us remember lastly of this. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. Let's do two things for the coming year, which we've probably done for many years in our lives already. First, to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our lives and let that recognition be shown in the fact that we are faithful to him. Paul in this same epistle says, some people plant the seed, some people water the seed, but it is God who comes along and gives the produce, that gives the harvest. So our responsibility is to be faithful. Be faithful in planting the seed, be faithful in watering the seed, and be faithful in trusting God to bring the results in due time. So 2020 is going to be easy for us if you follow my advice, all you need to do is recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ without fail and remain faithful without fail. And if you said, Pastor, that's too strong, remember, there's one who is stronger than ourselves and faithful is he to his people. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the life that you have given to us in Christ Jesus. Often is the time that we become our own worst enemies because of the weakness of our faith. 
And so we thank you that by the presence of your Holy Spirit, faith grows, faith increases, faith expands, faith becomes stronger. And these are the things that we wish for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters. That we will have a faith that increases and a love that increases commensurate to our faith. May this be our goal in life, and we ask that you will indeed honor that goal and enable us by your grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Turn to hymn number 232. We will sing verse 1 and 2. And then at the end of the second verse, we'll sing the chorus, which is not in your book, but you do know it. God be with you till we meet again, till we meet. And we'll continue the song without it being written here. So please stand as we sing hymn number 232. Two verses first and then the chorus. close in prayer. Father, we have bothered, been here together today to hear your word proclaimed through Pastor Don and through song by Alice. Thank you for them. Thank you for their faithfulness to this congregation. And may they always be faithful to us and may we always be faithful to him. And now from the book of Job, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.